the trustee will come in and offer two other legal options. That's the proposal and the bankruptcy. So the proposal is essentially a negotiation with the creditors, with the catch being it has to be better for creditors than if that person were to have been bankrupt. So there has to be some benefit because it is a, a voted idea. A bankruptcy is basically forced on creditors, whereas a proposal is a, here's what I'd like to do. Creditors, do you agree with me? Are you okay with this? Justice. I'm your host, Heather Malarick of Merrick Law. I'm usually joined by my co-host, Evan Clark of Kahane Law, but he is unable to join us this week. Uh, we're also joined today by our very special guest, Kim McDonald of McDonald Advisory. Kim is a financial advisor and insurance advisor with Raymond James Limited. We're a Canadian podcast with a mission to educate Canadians about the law. We interview experts in the law, mental health, and finance fields, focusing on topics that create the greatest barriers in to entry into the justice system. You can find us on YouTube, on our A2J podcast channel, and online at a2jpodcast.com. We are so pleased to welcome today's guest, Sandra Landry. Um, Kim, I understand that Sandra is a buddy of yours, so I'm going to um, pass the mic to you, and maybe you can introduce Ms. Landry to our guests today. I would be pleased to do that. So I met Sandra, it's got to be over a decade ago, when, and I think this is right, she'll correct me if I'm wrong, but we, I was doing a... Um, um, stock stock trading course at our seminar at Grant McEwen <laughs> and uh, I had a class full of people who were looking to figure out how um, the stock trading world worked and Sandra was there in my class and I laugh about it now because I can't even remember what I even talked about or what I was teaching people but um, she she kind of stuck out in the group and we just sort of struck up a, a friendship after that. Is that, Sandra, would you say that's right? It is. You know, it's funny. It feels like a lifetime ago um, <laughs> when we were, when we were there, but yeah, you're right. That was it. And, and I do remember thinking, holy mackerel, I need to get investing. I I'm already <laughs> behind. And, and, uh, Ten years ago, I'm certainly not as old as I am now. So, uh, so hopefully, I've made some good changes since that point in time. Yes. Well, I'm sure you have because I know you're a very smart cookie. So, uh, for our audience today, Sandra is senior vice president at Myers Norris Penny, and and I think they've shortened it now to just the MNP Ltd. Yes. So, Sandra is a chartered insolvency and restructuring professional. She is a licensed insolvency trustee. She is a CPA, a CA. She does it all. She is a wonder woman, a mother, a uh, amazing person. And um, I am just uh, totally excited to have her on the program today. And Sandra, if I've got, do I have any of those credentials wrong? We're going to have to dive into to what these actually are and who insolvency professionals are, what they do. Did I get that right? You did get that right. It sounds quite long now that you say it all out loud. I feel like I studied for a very, very long time to to gather all of those credentials. But yes, I started out on the accounting track and my intention was to be an accounting partner and that's what I was going to do. Uh, and then I discovered insolvency uh, and realized that I was completely off base and, and now I finally knew what I was supposed to do with my life. And and decided to go back to school again and learn how to be a trustee and work in the insolvency world. And now I am over here at MNP working in the consumer insolvency practice here, which is a ton of fun, uh, always something new. People never fail to surprise me. Uh, and there's always something new that comes up. So I am never bored. 
I, I don't imagine you are. You're in a very complicated profession, or at least the, the stuff that happens around you is complicated. Have you spent your entire career at MMP, or is, I, I can't remember if you've been there the whole time. No, I came over to MNP here about 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been here a few years now, but, but definitely the right place for me, the right work for me. I know this is where I'm meant to be. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic um, profession to be in. Awesome. It's a little bit unknown. Generally, until, until you stumble upon insolvency, you don't really know what it is. Uh, and there's a few... A uh, few accounting firms that practice in insolvency, but nobody really knows what those people do. They're a bit secret. What drew you to away from accounting and towards insolvency? Actually, I hadn't even received my, my response yet on whether I had passed my CA exam at the time. And one of my colleagues working in the insolvency practice said, hey, we need a bit of help on this file. It would be great if we had somebody with some accounting experience. Why don't you come over and, and help us out? So I did that. And I thought, oh, that was kind of fun. And I said, you know, if you ever need me again, just let me know. And it wasn't that long after when he approached me again and he said, hey, I've got something else. Do you wanna, do you wanna come over? We're actually gonna take possession of a company. We're gonna change the locks, do an inventory. Inventory is what I did as an accountant, especially as a, a junior staff member. Uh, so you inventory everything that a business owns. So I understood that process and, and what was going to come of it. And so I, I had the experience of jumping in on the corporate side over there. And it just provided me an opportunity of a real look into what insolvency meant and what that was going to mean for that business, for that business owner, for the, for the lenders involved. And I thought, oh, wow, yeah, this is what I was supposed to be doing with my life. Uh, so it was just kind of happenstance that I jumped in on, on that. And then over the next year or two, I slowly just started dabbling in and dabbling in. And then finally, I had to jump both feet in and, and get to school. <laughs> well, that's a great story. I, lo I love that kind of thing when people just kind of find, find where their heart leads them. And you, you, found, you found your calling. That's yeah. wonderful. I'm very fortunate, yes. But, and, but how is it fun when everybody's sad that surrounds themselves with you because things are not going well? What's what's the fun part about it? The fun part is seeing the change, the, the afterwards. And you are absolutely right. Generally, when people come see us, they are heartbroken. They are angry. They are a ton of emotions. And very rarely is it joy. But when you see them after that sign up, after the proposal has been accepted or after they're into that bankruptcy and you see the, the weight that's been lifted, the, the stress that's now gone, because financial pressure can be incredibly stressful. You see that other side of it. You see where life has changed. And, and every once in a while, we have the opportunity to, to see where people go after and they'll, they'll call us back after and say, so this is what I'm doing now. And, it, and it's changed their lives. It's changed the direction that they were going to go. Um, wow. You have people with some serious mental health issues as a result of the financial pressures that they sometimes suffer. And you can see where their mental health is, um, is changing. And, and not only that, but the work itself can be very fun. It's challenging. It's, it's new things that you learn all of the time. There's always something else to learn and and it's a different community of people that you work with and that community is is just a fun community to work with it's it's a small world the insolvency world mm, interesting yeah okay i'm gonna um maybe bring us i'm gonna ask a really general question because when i hear insolvency i'm a family lawyer i don't know a ton about um about insolvency law, but when I hear that, I think bankruptcy, are those two concepts interchangeable? Or are they the same? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about insolvency, we're talking about an ability to repay creditors. So how that ability <clears throat> gets fixed 
is where bankruptcy falls in. So there's there's a, a few legal ways to, to deal with creditors, but there's also non-legal measures. And sometimes that's just negotiating with creditors. Sometimes it might be refinancing uh, significant assets like uh, houses and that sort of thing. But insolvency is really just an inability to pay essentially. <clears throat> And they might take a legal route to, to try and deal with that. And that might be an orderly payment of debt, which is a piece of the act that uh, the trustee doesn't, um, doesn't take forward. There, there's one group here in Alberta that does that. That's, that's money mentors. They'll do an orderly payment of debt. But a, a, a person is going to pay all of their debt back in full with an option like that. The trustee will come in and offer two other legal options that's the proposal and the bankruptcy so the proposal is essentially a negotiation with the creditors with the catch being it has to be better for creditors than if that person were to have been bankrupt so there has to be some benefit because it is a a voted idea a bankruptcy is basically forced on creditors whereas a proposal is a here's what i'd like to do creditors do you agree with me are you okay with this? Hmm. So in, in the orderly, um, you know, sorting or the process of dealing with creditors and debt, is it is it fair to say that there is just the two processes? There's either you pursuing a bankruptcy or you're pursuing a consumer proposal. Is that is that how it works? Just like one or the other? In, in the realm of a trustee's world, yeah, if you're coming into our office, you're either doing a proposal or you're doing a bankruptcy uh, if it's going through our office. And there are a couple of different variations of each one of those options. And a lot of that simply has to do with levels of debt or levels of assets. So how the, uh, how the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act wants to deal with it is going to be slightly different. So somebody, say for example, <clears throat> has 200,000 or more of debt, they're gonna be in a bigger category of a proposal than somebody who comes in with less. And we're just talking debt that's not related to their principal residence. So if they have a house and a mortgage on it, it doesn't count towards that $250,000. Uh, and then on the bankruptcy side, you could have a summary bankruptcy, but you could also have an ordinary bankruptcy, and that's simply related to assets that come along with it. Um, the Act is, um, is setting out a $15,000 asset limit. So $15,000 and less, you're going to be a summary. Over, you're going to be an ordinary where where those come in play there's lots of different um lots of different requirements that come with each one of those the voting will be different for the proposals the way that we deal with the bankruptcies can be a little bit different uh as well but there is there are essentially those two options despite the fact that there's two within each one of those mm -hmm. How are folks finding themselves in your office? Like, how does a person know, uh oh, I'm kind of in over my <laughs> head here. I should be looking for some solutions to my financial troubles. Is there sort of a bright line or they get sued by a credit card company? How, do, how are folks finding their way to you, Sandra? It's a good question. Sometimes... Sometimes they'll end up in somebody else's office who will have an ability to see that bigger picture. So we'll work with a lot of, say, mortgage brokers. A lot of folks will go and see their mortgage broker and they go, I really need to refinance my house. I need to get some equity out. And the broker says, well, um, sorry, it could be a broker or through the banks themselves, right. their lender. Um I need to get some money out of my house. The lender says, why do you need this money? What's happening? And they mm -hmm. say, well, I have all of this debt I need to repay. Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a no, but it might be a red flag. And they might say, you know what? Yeah, we can, we can lend you X number of dollars against the equity of your house, but you're not going to have enough money to repay all your creditors. You're still going to be in a bad situation perhaps now's the time you talk to a trustee and they'll say go find a trustee but they also might go to um 
there's some credit counselors out there uh, who try and just counsel folks outside of any legal process. Sometimes they will say we can't help you and, and direct them over. We've even had um, any other kind of lender uh, or somebody who goes to try and get a vehicle or try and borrow more money for camper who knows whatever it is that they're going to borrow money for mm -hmm. and they will say look you you owe too much money we don't want to mm -hmm. loan you any more money and they will say hey go find a trustee but sometimes it is so simple as there is now a judgment in place and that is really scary for uh, anybody who receives a judgment they don't know what that means they don't know what that's uh, what's going to come from that and so they'll be Googling and, and trying to find out what do I do with my debt? Uh, and that's kind of how they end up finding our office. So there is a lot of that as well. So you guys, you guys work closely with insolvency lawyers. How, how does somebody know if they should be reaching out to an accountant or, a, or an insolvency, like an insolvency accountant or an insolvency lawyer? Good question. Um, in Canada, only a trustee can do a bankruptcy or a proposal. So a lawyer can't do that part. There is some circumstances where a lawyer will work on behalf of somebody else and put somebody into a bankruptcy. That's quite rare, mm -hmm. um, but that, that bankruptcy would still have to be uh, managed by a trustee. The lawyers will come in. They'll, you'll see insolvency lawyers work a lot more on corporate sides where um, they'll be dealing with the lenders uh, and that sort, but they could also come in on a consumer side. Let's say, for example, somebody files a bankruptcy. They don't do what they're supposed to do. The file gets closed. Well, a bankruptcy is a one-way door. You don't you don't walk through that and then change your mind partway through and say, I'm going to walk back out and, and be done with my bankruptcy. It doesn't work like that. You've got to complete the duties as required under the act if you want to get back out of it. So they they disappear for a while, they go away and they pretend that their bankruptcy didn't exist. They don't do what they're supposed to do. And years later, they they want to deal with it. Sometimes an insolvency lawyer will, will be able to help that individual get back out of that bankruptcy and complete whatever requirements of the act there are. So you might see that. Or you might see somebody who has a really high tax debt when we get into some high tax debt levels, it means that somebody is automatically going to court. So there's some legislation in place that says, look, if you owe $200,000 or more in tax debt and it's 75% of your uh, total overall debt, you're gonna be going to court and you're gonna have to tell the court why you owe this tax debt. And there's a really good chance that CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, is going to be there and going to be opposing your discharge. So opposing your discharge means they don't want you to get out of bankruptcy. They want you to stay in longer and they want you to pay more money. They want that tax debt paid more in full than what you've, what you've had to do by law already. So sometimes you'll see in those circumstances on that consumer side where that bankrupt person might want to have a lawyer to help them fight their side of it. So you won't see it so much on the consumer side, but you will periodically in these unusual circumstances. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. So generally, first person to go see is the trustee. And that's because our job is to make sure that the person that comes, sees us, comes to see us knows what all of the options are. And that does mean all of the options, including things that we don't do. So we can't just tell them about a bankruptcy and proposal and be done with it. They have to know about the orderly payment of debt. They have to know if there's another option out there if we don't think that this route is the direct route to the, to the solution. There are sometimes solutions that are not things that we do. I can remember one time I, I, call, I think I called you because I had somebody asking me questions about debt and they weren't sure how bad it was. And... 
I remember calling you saying, well, when, when does this person reach out? And you, and I'm pretty sure your answer was, you know, there's no harm in reaching out. Like sometimes it's better to reach out to us right away so we can make sure that things don't get worse and worse and worse um, versus kind of just sitting there stewing on your debt and trying to bury it down because you don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. So I remember like that stuck with me because there's so Mm -hmm. many people who are stuck in their problem and um, sometimes it's just a phone call to an insolvency trustee who says, oh, here's the way that you can work through this. And to your point earlier, that mental health issue starts to maybe subside a bit and maybe they're less likely to go visit Heather over on the yeah. divorce side. Right. Um, they maybe don't need to be dividing their debts in a divorce scenario. So, yeah. I'm yeah, really- and, it's, and that is exactly it. The sooner you ask questions, the sooner you're going to be clear-headed because of that stress and the mental health that comes with that what sometimes ends up happening is they don't ask questions they don't they don't have any idea what options are out there and so the stress gets worse and then they panic and the worst thing to do is panic in any situation Um, and finances is the same thing we've had people panic they'll they'll cash in all their investments they'll cash in all their rsps their their pensions if they can get any money out of their pensions uh, they'll do that as well and they're cleared all out and then they still end up in our office and i and i say like why didn't you just ask before but they they don't they panic they they Uh think they're gonna fix it all but they there aren't they're not in a spot that they can see that whole picture of how that's going to play out. And they won't think of something so simple as the tax effect of cashing in all of those investments. And then they have a big tax bill and CRA comes knocking on their door. And then again, they panic, they'll borrow against their house and now their house is fully leveraged and they can't make their mortgage payments. And and so they do. So, so you're right, I will always say, it doesn't cost you any money to to call a trustee to sit down and look and run all those numbers and and see what those options are sometimes sometimes we can just send people away and say you know what i think if you try x y and z you might be okay mm. and if it doesn't come back but at least they're not in panic mode making decisions off the cuff mm-hmm. Uh, my my palms are sweating from that description <laughs> that stressed me out so uh, I can imagine that it is a tough time and there's there's probably some element of shame too that comes along with that and that there's sort of an embarrassment and a reluctance to want to lay it all out for someone um are, I'm assuming this is the answer to this is yes, but are your services are confidential? You don't need to tell anyone. You're not bound to tell anybody that someone's come to see you and to do like sort of a consult on their financial situation. Absolutely. They're always confidential. And, and for us, especially, we never charge anyone for that consultation, that initial, um, Because if they don't end up filing with us, no harm, no foul, we'll go about your business. Um, But yes, where where we would be conflicted is if they tell us something, so if they come in and they do a consult and they tell us about something they've they've done and we know it's it's not going to be, I'll call it appropriate under the act, so it's something they shouldn't have done. Um, it, we can't ignore it later when they come back and they do that filing. We'll tell them what the impact of their decisions are going to be. Um, but we don't run out and tell other people. We don't call their employer. We don't tell their spouses. Uh, we do have people file whose spouses have no idea um, that they're even in our office, that they filed at anything. And, and that really does come down to embarrassment or shame that they think um, that they should have been able to handle it themselves. And it's, it's a real struggle for us to express how common it really is. Mm. So I always tell people that I would guarantee that you know somebody who has talked to a trustee, filed something, is insolvent, is somewhere in that realm. Everybody knows somebody. And you are a lot less alone than you think. And there are 
stigmas uh, around those filings, and yet hundred and some odd thousand people a year are probably doing a filing in Canada. So uh, every year, that's a lot of people. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. and sorry, you had mentioned um, the strain that it can put on relationships. And that is a major reason for people coming into our office. So the financial stress that it puts on a family um, creates that stress within the relationship. I looked up on the our governing body's website and their stats from 2019 um, say 15% of filings in Canada are somehow connected to a divorce and separation. So mm -hmm. as a result of either a divorce and separation, but it can also be the other way. Uh, divorce and separation can result in the financial harm. Financial harm can result in the divorce and separation. So there's there's a real correlation between that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's always a, that's a tough one. And we, we spend a lot of time as a family lawyer, you can appreciate that it gets complicated, but it gets exponentially more complicated once an insolvency is in place. There's a lot of things that people do or plan on doing that will, will get a wrench thrown in it because now a trustee is involved. So I always say, you know, if, if, if somebody comes into our office and we know that they're in the midst of a separation or a divorce, I always say, you know, let your family lawyer know because some of what we're doing here is going to impact something that you are planning and it's going to change what you think is going to happen. So the big stuff that I always think about um, would be, you know, somebody wants to go after their spouse for something. So let's say somebody comes into our office and they want to go after their spouse. Well, some of the things that they want to go after their spouse for, they they lose the right to do so. And that now comes in as we call it vesting with the trustee, which means it belongs in that estate and the, and the trustee has control of that legal action. So they can't just run off and continue all legal actions when the trustee becomes involved. And so it's always important that they know that um, they need to know what they're protected from as far as, as creditors and any spousal supports, those sorts of things. They've got some really special law attached to them that allows them to either continue to garnish for those uh, or it allows them to get a, a priority of the money in the estate. So that can also uh, change what somebody is doing. Hmm. Hmm. So... That's interesting. I often uh, try, well, I congratulate the young couples or people who are embarking maybe on their second marriages and learn the first time around that that money conversation is really important. It seems to be like one of the remaining taboo topics. Um, not, I mean, not just between friends, but between people who are getting married and, and entwining their finances. It amazes me sometimes that people you know, don't even know until the divorce disclosure process, all the debts and assets and everything that they have. So, um, yeah, that's, it's really interesting. And I think, yeah, we could all, right. it is, it's, it's incredibly surprising how, how well people keep those sorts of things secreted from each other, which is unfortunate because sometimes the other person is, is better with their finances and would probably help um, but there's, there's a lot of secret that happens and it's mm -hmm. unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just to maybe even have, be more aware of what kind of relationship you have with money, what kind of spender you are, what your financial, your mutual financial goals are, stuff like that. You're right. And, and those conversations don't always happen and, but they'll, they'll jump in together on the on the legal basis so they'll, yeah. they'll say yeah let's borrow this money together we're joint and severally liable i'm sure it's yeah. fine they, they don't ask a lot of questions and right and then forget that later if that other person doesn't pay joint joint debt means joint debt the, mm -hmm. the lender can come after both of you or one of you whatever's 
generally, if I always say it's whoever's the easier one, that's who they're going to try and collect from first. So, right. um, you know, sometimes the tricky part when, when a spouse comes in is the debt will be quote unquote incurred by one partner. So even if they're together, it'll be incurred by one partner and they say, oh, I'm the only one that spent it except the other person's name is on it, mm -hmm. even though they didn't rack it up. Well, the person filing with us is protected, but what about spouse who actually didn't really need to file? Now that joint debt is gonna fall onto their shoulders. So now they've got a financial problem. We, we definitely see that more than I would like. Mm -hmm. So then do you, do you recommend this is kind of a question that you probably can't even answer, but um, do you recommend couples have separate accounts and manage their money separately in some way so they can track, you know, who's the spender and who's the saver in the relationship? Do you have any budgeting tips for people out there? That is a tricky one. You're right. And I'd love to be able to say, if you just keep everything separate, you'll be fine. But we all know that you know, it's not always that easy, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, for a circumstance, let's say you've got one parent that stays at home uh, with the children and the other parent is the one making the money. Does that mean the one that's staying home isn't allowed to have credit? Right. That seems, seems a bit unfair, uh, but it is, I think, I think it really does come down to asking those questions and, and talking to that partner. And when, and when one person is doing something that you're not comfortable with. So if you, if you're the saver and your partner is the spender, you want to be able to talk to your spender and say, whoa, 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 you're starting to make me uncomfortable and you're making me legally responsible for this. We got to find a solution before it gets to the point where, um, where we're unhappy about it. Uh, but the budgeting, and I will, I will tell you, I will talk about budgeting all day and all night. There is, <laughs> there is nothing that is going to be more important than budgeting. And it, and budgeting, I think, I think people think that budgeting means we're going to write all these numbers down and this is how we're supposed to spend our money. And then off we go. But budgeting doesn't work like that. Budgeting means you're going to come back a month later, two weeks later, however it is that you set it up and go, okay, but did we actually spend like that? Or was this a pipe dream? Like if I put in my budget that I'm going to spend $50 a month on eating out and I, and I go about my business and I don't think about it, but really I'm spending 200 I just haven't been putting it on credit, so I don't notice it. Your budget is is failing. You haven't done yourself any service, and I, and I, and I will say that it's important that when you're budgeting, that it isn't a point of judgment. So you don't go back to your budget and go, "Yeah, I actually spent two hundred. Silly me. What was I thinking? Come on, why can't I spend so much? It's not that. You're the only one that sees it." maybe you and your spouse, but nobody is there judging you. You can spend your money any way you want and it can be eating out every single day as long as your budget is still working. So as long as you've covered the things that you need to cover and you're not going into debt in order to manage that, who cares? Go ahead and eat out every day. Nobody's there to decide what's right or wrong for you. Right. So budgeting is a... It's a forever thing. I will tell you, I budget at least every two months. Hmm. And, and really, my expenses don't change that much. But I like keeping track of it. I like seeing if there's something else we want to do with our money. Maybe, maybe you put your emergency fund as your priority number one in your budget for right now. And you want to build up your emergency fund. Well, six months from now, maybe that's not your priority. Maybe it's... I know that I'm going to be wanting to go on vacation and it's going to be an expensive one. So now I'm going to switch my priority and now I'm going to spend more money putting, putting that into my vacation fund. So it's, it's really just about balancing your expectations, your actuals and kind of the direction that you want to go. So budgeting is forever and ever and ever and ever until you die.
you keep budgeting forever. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's good to know that that's the reality (laughs) from the outset. (laughs) But it sounds like it's not a set it and forget it thing. You set up sort of your general idea, but you're just, you're reviewing it and making sure that it still makes sense, that it's working and yeah. Yeah. Knowledge is power. That kind of idea. Is that right? That's exactly what it is. Yeah. You can't, you can't fix it. You can't make any changes if you don't actually know whether it's broken or not. Uh 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 Yeah. Yeah, It's funny. I, uh, sometimes you think you can, if there's money in the bank account, then it can be spent. Right. But (laughs) people forget that there's things that are coming up, expenses, that kind of thing. And that, Mm -hmm. yeah, you end up at the end of the month and all the payments come out and oops. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, what's funny. I am, that is my personality. I I look at my bank account and and this is what I'm allowed to spend. And so I knew I was never going to change that. That was going to be me. I'm going to spend until the money's gone and whatever I want. So when I started budgeting, what I did is I I just simply separated. So when I planned my budget, I would move money into another account or another couple of accounts, depending on kind of what works for your, uh, your personality and then have payments come out of that account. And I would always just budget, I would move my savings, I would move my bill payments, my mortgage, all of those things into another account. And that way I knew that whatever was left in my bank account is what I was allowed to spend. And I could spend that until it said insufficient funds. And then I was done. Right. Right. And hopefully you don't get insufficient funds when you're making a purchase too often. But it, but that's kind of, yeah, the premise of it is this is what you've left for whatever you felt like spending your money on. Uh, so you do have to budget your your fun stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The banks nowadays are helping out with that kind of mental accounting. So you can set up in your online banking to move a certain amount of money to another account automatically every single month. So why not start to use some of these tools and put the money aside for fun and put the money aside for expenses that are going to happen every single month. And, um, you know, hopefully it'll help you balance things out in in the end. But this made me think a a lot about the news recently about uh, sports betting in Canada. And um, so so we've got this new bill coming out where um, people are going to be doing a lot more sports betting. It's allowed, it's legal. And I just think, holy moly, like gambling is already blowing up families. It's a very devastating disease. And now we're adding more of that into society. How busy is Sandra going to be when this Uh, bill passes and people start gambling more and more like they, you know, we've seen in the UK and and the United States. It's very scary. uh, Yeah. Some of those things make it very easy to spend your money, right? uh uh Absolutely. Yeah. And, and gambling's a, gambling is a tricky one. It's one of those parts of the act where right or wrong, and there's certainly some controversy as to whether or not it should still exist in there, but any folks relating um, to a bankruptcy is relating to a gambling debt. It's not quite so simple as, as what somebody else would have to deal with. There is requirements under the act that, um, that they get help during the bankruptcy and, mm-hmm. and they generally will require additional work or additional money or a change to a court order. Um, gambling's one of those ones that the bankruptcies get opposed on, mm-hmm. which, is, which isn't great. So, so yeah, you're right, Kim, that might, uh, that might change things. Mm-hmm. And, and we've certainly had our share of gamblers uh, in our office and they, It's the same thing every time it's lots of money and they think that they're going to be able to make it back. And it's, it's a, uh, a hard price to pay. Yeah. I had a file once where the other party was doing a lot of online gambling and it was just sad to see the bank statements, you know, it would be a thousand, two thousand dollars a night and just see transaction after transaction going out. It is. Um, 
I, yeah, I guess that's kind of a double-edged thing where there's a recognition that it's an illness and needs help, but then there's added steps and challenges then if that's what you're coming to see you about. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Sandra, so I'm going to ask sort of a maybe basic or obvious question. So if you have a family or a person that comes to you and you see that they're going to need to file for bankruptcy, go into bankruptcy, what does that look like? And what does it actually mean? You know, you hear people saying like, it's seven years of bad luck. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like breaking a mirror. You're never going to get a credit card again, or you'll never have a house or they take your car from you. Like, what is, what is that? What is the reality of that process? What does it look like? So it's not half as scary as what, uh, what the rumors portray it to be. So the way that the act is now set out is they, they've set it, set timelines based on number of times a person has filed bankruptcy. So they set out a first time file or a second time filer, and then anyone above there. So anyone who's never filed a bankruptcy before is either a nine or 21 month bankruptcy. And the way that's determined is just income. So the government sets a guideline and it says, look, if, you're, if your income is over this guideline and it changes based on number of people in the family, if it's over this guideline, you're in for 21 months. If you're under this guideline, you're in for nine months and you'll pay based on that. So in essence, more money you make, more money you pay, longer you stay in. Duties that come along with that are monthly budgets. So if you weren't comfortable with budgets before, you get comfortable during the bankruptcy. And that's part of just that mental process of, of learning something throughout. Um, you'll do a couple of financial counseling sessions. And then ideally, you get to the end of that nine or the 21 month bankruptcy and you get an automatic discharge. And automatic discharge is the majority of people provided they've done everything that they're supposed to do. What extends those is when people don't do what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> So it has to go into the court system. So those high tax debtors, they don't get that automatic discharge that has to go through the court system. So if somebody doesn't do their duties, it's got to go through the court system. And when we're looking at um, those assets, so there's no requirement for a trustee to take assets. We, we have the assets become part of the estate. So that's the vesting that I was talking about earlier. So they vest in the estate. Well, that doesn't mean that we just run around collecting people's valuables. Certain things are protected. Those are called exemptions. And depending on the province, those exemptions will change. What the trustee is interested in is equity in those assets. So, so for example, a house. If a person is, let's say they're just a single owner, they've got a house with lots of equity. The law will say, okay, we're going to protect $40,000 of that equity for you. And what your creditors have a right to is everything over. A trustee will have the conversation with that bankrupt individual and say, okay, so you've got this equity that needs to be paid in. What do you want to do? And sometimes that debtor says, I want to sell my house. This isn't working. Okay, house gets sold. They get their 40000 We get our equity, whatever that is. Uh, same thing with vehicles. They've got, a, they've got an exemption limit. Uh, work tools, they'll have an exemption limit. There's special exemptions for farms. So there's lots of stuff that's protected. We're not really in the business of selling assets. So ideally, we don't want to do that. But if somebody says, look, yeah, I don't want my I don't want my car and there's a bunch of equity, we can have that picked up. We can have it auctioned and, and have the money paid in that way. But there's no, you have to lose your car. Nobody's sneaking over to your house in the middle of the night and, and taking it. Uh, and sometimes people think that's going to happen, even if they're not keeping their car and it's fully secured. So we as the trustee have no interest in it, but the lender certainly does. Um, they don't sneak over at midnight and try and sneak your car out of the driveway. Right? They, they, phone, they phone you and they say, hey, we're going to be picking up the vehicle. And you say, okay, let's arrange a time. And they hand them the keys back. So it's not, it's not quite like what's shown on television in the US. Nobody, nobody sneaks over. Okay. And the seven years, what people are thinking about when they're re referencing that seven years. So, but the rule of the, the, um, 
the two credit reporters, so you've got Equifax and TransUnion, it's going to sit on their credit report for six years after the date you're discharged. Well, if you're a nine-month bankruptcy, that's pretty close to seven years, so people will say seven. Right. But if you're a 21-month bankruptcy or you're a second-time bankruptcy, that number is significantly higher. So it'll be six years from that discharge date mm. for bankruptcy. Mm. Mm. And nobody goes to jail, by the way. Okay. <laughs> good to know. So Dog the Bounty Hunter is not knocking on anybody's door. <laughs> no, you'd be surprised how many people ask if they're going to jail. Mm. And it has been a very long time since there was a bankruptcy jail. I want to say the late 1800s since, okay. since that happened. So people are pretty safe. Okay. Well, that's reassuring. <laughs> yes. Um, so you mentioned discharge of a bankrupt. So what does that mean? Does that mean poof, all of those debts are gone then at the end of nine months, provided you've been uh, a good debtor, I guess, or bankrupt during those nine months? For the most part, yeah, that's exactly what that means. It says this is it. So when they when they file that bankruptcy, something called a stay of proceedings goes into place. And what that means is that as of right now, everything is frozen. And it sits there frozen while you do all of the things that you're supposed to do. You get to the end and the debt is discharged. So you're no longer legally required to repay that amount. That said, there are some special uh, debts that are out there that don't get that uh, discharge. And those might be a student loan. So if you've been in school and you've been in school, um, you have to be out of school seven years before they'll get discharged. Wow. Um, support payments like uh, child support or spousal support, those will survive a bankruptcy or a proposal. Things related to fraud, those would survive. So there are some special things that would survive, but the majority of debt, Yep, the discharge is the is the end of it. And I'm guessing, I think we haven't said it out loud, but making payments towards that debt during your bankruptcy is one of those requirements. So you're probably looking at their financial situation and saying, based on your income, you've got this much that you can be paying towards your to your creditors during this bankruptcy. Is that is that right? Yes. So that guideline that I was talking about, that standard that's set by the government, and, and bearing in mind, this standard is set essentially for everyone in Canada. So somebody in Edmonton is going to pay based on the same standard as somebody in Manitoba. That's a federal uh, number. And it says, look, if you earn more income than this, you're going to pay more. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's how we determine what they have to pay. That one's called surplus income. Okay. Yeah. And, and if they're a nine month bankruptcy, we'll simply just have them pay a minimum fee into the estate. Is part of those payments, like part of it paying back debts and, and is there a behavior component to that? Like they want to teach people good behaviors. Is that sort of. For the money part. I think the money part is the the lenders are owed something and the the legislation is trying to get the lenders some sort of recovery that is fair the behavior correction is where that budget sheet comes in so that's why it's one of those reasons um, that a bankruptcy would get opposed so especially with bankruptcy, the courts will frown on that. If they can't manage to do a budget, they're probably not learning anything from the process. So that is the behavior that they're trying to correct. The money is, look, we'll get you it as much as we can creditors while making sure that the, the debtor is not, I guess, financially jeopardized. You don't want to put them in a place where they're worse off than when they came in. Mm -hmm. Hey. Is there any, um, I guess, theme or common way people sort of end up in insolvency? Or are there a few different themes? Or is it sort of like every, every situation is really unique? Yeah, I think for the most part, every situation is unique. But 
the stats suggest that there are a few things that happen to have somebody end up in our office. Number one is um, loss of employment. Mm. Sometimes loss of employment can be a bunch of things. It doesn't just mean that they've lost their job. It might be their spouse has lost their job or they're now widowed and they don't have that partner's income. Uh, so that's a, a relatively big category, but that's kind of reason number one. Next one is medical problems. So sometimes people will end up in our office and something has happened and they are now unwell. Again, that, that kind of goes back to employment where they cannot work, uh, right. unable to work. Sometimes there will be an expectation that at some point they're going to go back to work, but not always. It might be permanent. And then, of course, the separation and divorce, that's another big one, where now you have, you have a household that had two incomes, you've now got two households, right. how do you manage that same level of expense? And that's sometimes where they come in, uh, because they, they're not set up mm. to, to financially be able to manage that. Mm. Mm. So Kim can probably help mitigate some of those things with things like, I'm guessing, disability insurance, stuff like that. Um, and some of it is just life circumstances. Absolutely. I think, I think for some people, they feel that they need to explain to us that it wasn't their fault, mm. which is a bit unfortunate. The assumption when people come into our office is always non-judgmental. It's the, the assumption that something has happened. The act says it is there to help the honest but unfortunate debtor get a fresh start. Mm -hmm. It says that right in the act. And that is the whole point of it. And, and it's always our job to approach it as such. They are mm -hmm. honest, unfortunate. We need to help them get a fresh start. So it's mm -hmm it's really key that we, we make the assumption that somebody didn't intend to be here. Yeah. Pretty rare when you meet somebody who has planned for a bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously there are, there are laws in place that allow us to deal with somebody who, who did sort of plan their bankruptcy. There's, there's that, but 99.9% .9 of the individuals circumstances have simply changed that they didn't expect or were not unable to plan for or simply didn't know how to plan for. Right. Yeah. So sometimes I think bankruptcy, I guess maybe is seen as um, a consequence or a punishment, but really it's meant to be a tool to assist those who have through misfortune ended up in in a financial situation that's become unmanageable that's exactly what it's meant to be so whether it be the bankruptcy or whether it be that proposal mm -hmm. that is the whole point is to almost how would i say it organize the situation and get it under control it is it's imperative to make sure that everybody is treated the same not all creditors or collection agencies act the same. And there are some collectors who are very, very good at what they do. They will, they will scare someone, mm. they will make them cry, they will become their best friend, they will use whatever tactic required in order to collect. And they do not care that, it, that they collect in priority to somebody else who is also owed money. And so what the point of this is, is to put everybody on a playing field that is level, make sure we understand who the special creditors are, whether they're the um, maintenance and those sorts of things, but making sure that the debtor is doing exactly what they're supposed to, getting the creditors as much as they can and making sure that everybody is being treated fairly. So it's, it's very much to keep it organized, keep it fair, and mm. hopefully mitigate as any further damage. And sometimes the trustee is brought in to protect assets, to, to make sure nothing happens. Um, because those assets vest, vest with the trustee, sometimes 
lenders will want the trustee to jump in to make sure things are protected. Mm -hmm. hmm. Co-signing, question on co-signing. <laughs> I've seen it <laughs> more and more this year than I've ever seen in my career where parents are co-signing on debts for their kids. <laughs> And I, I'm not 100% certain, actually, I don't really know anything about the liability of, of somebody co-signing on loans. What's your opinion on that scenario as how does this become more expensive and parents are trying to figure out how to protect their, how to help their kids, but also protect their kid from a, a divorce potentially? What's your thoughts on that? Now, I have to be careful that I don't overstep I don't want to be giving any legal advice but I think I think it's important that when somebody is co-signing a debt especially a big debt like a house I encourage them to seek legal advice I encourage them to go to a lawyer and say what does this really mean for me so if my child chooses not to pay their mortgage later what's going to happen and that lawyer should be able to give them advice and say, look, here's, they can come after you or they can't come after you, depending on what they've agreed to. Uh, if you're not on the house or you are on the house or if you're, and it sometimes depends on how the money is lended, it's, sorry, loaned. Um, it could, it could depend. Are they, are they a lender? Are they giving them money? Are they now a secured creditor? Or are they just signing off on something else that the, that the child is doing? And I, I have seen in my office where somebody has signed off on something, they've been co-signed and they become liable for it later, but they didn't know what they were signing. They didn't appreciate what any of that meant. And, and so if you, if you're going to want to get involved in the debt of anybody else, you better know exactly what it is that you're signing on for. And if anything goes south, are you going to have an ability to survive it? Mm. So is that an insolvency lawyer they would visit or a business lawyer? Or what, what do you think is the right lawyer that somebody should reach out to? Maybe Heather, you know, I don't know. Maybe Heather can. Yeah, I'm just thinking. I would think maybe someone who does real estate because they would know the uh, lending and the responsibility of all the people involved that are signing onto a mortgage or a credit line or yeah, if it's hooked with a house, I guess. Um, yeah. 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 And that means that, you know, if you have to, you have to spend the extra money and, and pay for somebody's legal opinion, down the road, it's probably going to be a really good investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're right, there there are a lot of parents who will do whatever it takes to try and help their children, which is wonderful. But as long as it isn't to their own detriment, that's kind of the key thing. And so get advice. Yeah. Yeah. I see a lot of those um, becoming a big question and separation, not so much the co-signing necessarily, but a gift to a helping out um, when couples are buying a house of who is that? What was it meant to be? Was it a loan or a gift? And was it just to one of them? Was it to both of them? Um, so yeah, it doesn't hurt to get some legal advice or document that when, when folks are doing that too, if they're helping the kids out, um, there's no right or wrong answer to how that's done, but that the intention gets reflected somewhere so that, you know, 20 years down the road, if you're looking at that question, it's there somewhere. You're right. And I've definitely seen that come through my office and people have said, well, my, my so-and-so gave us that money. Did they, like, can you show me that? Can you prove that? Is there any yeah. reason I shouldn't still be taking half of the value of this property as mm -hmm. part of our, part of this bankruptcy estate? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you definitely want to make sure that you've got paperwork done. Yeah. Yeah. Don't I give your family money without writing anything down. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and people think um, banks keep like indefinite records and stuff, but uh, they don't. <laughs> they, do <not. laughs> they are not going to be able to reprint your bank statement from uh, June of 1982 if you go in and ask them. So That's right. Yeah. And the ones that they can get are going to cost you money. Right, right. If they, that I have yeah. definitely seen where mm-hmm. people have tried to go back and it is, it's a fortune because they'll have, they don't, of course, know when exactly it happened. It, it, if they can even guess the right year, sometimes that's the, yeah. the deciding factor. But yeah. yeah, it costs money later, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mem- memories fade, that's for sure. They Micro, do. Microfiche machines die. That's where... We would pull that information from. I can remember doing it at my old investment firm. Uh, Client needs information from 1982. We could actually pull it, but we're going to this machine that's like, you know, four feet by four feet. And we're looking on this thing that looks like it was created when the dinosaurs were still on the planet. (laughs) So those machines, I'm sure, have all started to disappear and out goes the data with them, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Um, any like major no-nos or big tips or for sure do this for someone who's looking at, um, like evaluating their situation, if they're looking at maybe an orderly payment of debts or bankruptcy or a proposal. Big tip, uh, one that I've seen a couple of times lately is, um, Sometimes a trustee will forget to tell a person what's going to happen with the title. So when a person files a bankruptcy, if there is a a house and it's got a lot of equity where uh, let's say it's jointly held and the trustee has an interest in the bankrupt person's share of that equity, a trustee will often register the bankruptcy on the title of that property. But what it does is it changes that title. So it's no longer a jointly held title. It splits it and it's now two pieces. When that bankruptcy is done, it doesn't automatically get pieced back together. It leaves it as two titles. And that, um, you can correct me um, on any of the legal, but essentially what it means is that if one of those people die, it's not automatically transferring over to that other individual. And that can really impact their estate planning and things that they thought would have happened. So my caution always when somebody's coming in to do a bankruptcy, if there's if there's a joint title there, I always try and remind them that once that bankruptcy is over, they need to go down to land titles and, and put that put that title back together again. Um, that's a that's a really good tip. Yeah, it's so it changes it from tenants, joint tenants to tenants in common, which means that like that other spouse, if they passed away, it would just go to their estate instead of automatically going to the other co-owner, yeah. which is what most people have. That's sort of the standard state, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that can certainly cause some problems. Sure. The uh I guess the other thing is, is, you know, keeping in mind that when you, when you file a bankruptcy, everything that you own becomes property of the estate and continues to fall into that estate for as long as you are bankrupt. That can mean a lot of things. That means that if you're bankrupt and one of your family members passes away and you get an inheritance, that inheritance is going into that estate to pay your creditors. If you, if you are bankrupt, it continues to fall in and it's really key to understand that. Uh, And that's, that's a really big difference when we look at those two options. So with the proposal, assets don't vest with the trustee, everything's valued right at the beginning. And that's it. That means that, you know, if you win the lottery a year into your proposal, and it does happen uh, surprisingly often, um, you can take that money, you pay off your proposal, and then you travel over to your financial advisor's uh, office and you go see Kim and say, Kim, what do I do with the rest of my $59.9 million? <laughs> <laughs> Kim that, would be a good, that would be a good day. 
<laughs> be a good day. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and you know what? It, it's crazy because I've seen it three times. And some of it is big. I've seen it uh, two while they've been bankrupt and one while they've been in the proposal. So, wow. Life's funny that way. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? That's yeah. Funny. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any other um, big reminders. I think I, I think I wrote a couple of things down just because I wanted to make sure I didn't forget. Because uh, I'll notoriously forget. Uh, talk about those flames. Maybe not. Maybe I did talk about everything. <laughs> I have one point of, uh, I think it's probably worth clarifying for people who are married couples and they've got a, a spender and a saver in the household. So you have... Your spender, it's very difficult to control their spending habits. Let's be honest, like some of it is an inherent trait and it's very difficult to change those patterns. So, you know, like I get a lot of people who come to me who are saving money for retirement because their spouse just won't do it. And they feel they feel sad about having to be the saver in the household um, and the responsible one. Uh, but oftentimes they are, you know, they're exposed to the behaviors of the spender. And in, I don't know if we really clarified on this podcast, like how much of that debt does each spouse own by virtue of being a married mm-hmm. couple? Is it an equal debt and, and everybody owns half of whatever debt is in there or will creditor be able to separate debts somehow and, and force uh, repayments just on one party? <laughs> well, <laughs> that depends. Heather will give you one answer and then I will get involved and I will give you a different answer. Cool. <laughs> <sighs> Well, I, I guess my, I would say that the legal liability is whoever is signed on to that debt is legally responsible to pay it. So if it's just, if it's just Bill that's signed on to the debt, then he'd be responsible. If it's, um, if it's Bob and Bill who've signed on to it jointly, then they'd both be responsible for it, even if it's Bill that's running up the credit card. Yeah. And, and I... I always chuckle on this and it's, it's very much that I think sometimes though, when people separate that they think they'll, they'll write these agreements in their separation agreement. They'll say, well, Bill racked it all up. So Bill has to pay that back and, and they make this agreement and then they sign it and it's ordered and Bill's going to pay this. And then Bill doesn't pay this. Uh-huh. And then the bank comes after Bob Uh and Bob goes, but I signed an agreement and Bill said he's going to pay it. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for people to get past the fact that, well, the court said, but but the court doesn't take that liability out of the hands of the lender and say, no lender, you're not allowed to get this money anymore. But it probably gives Bob the ability to collect from Bill later if he pays it all. Uh, So I think that's where sometimes people get a bit confused and, and they certainly do in our office and they go, well, why would I file it? it was, I didn't spend it all. Look, my agreement says he's going to pay or she's yeah. going to pay. Yeah. And that is, that is a tough lesson uh, for, for people to learn. That's a, the worst is when they're filing something in our office and they haven't really spent any of the money and haven't had the privilege of, of having it. And all of the, the assets got put in the, the name of the other individual, um, which sometimes happens. So they'll buy lots of stuff and that's this person's, except both are responsible for the debt, which is a bit unfortunate. I see that with vehicles a lot, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really good point um, and something to be alive to is that, yeah, your separation agreement can't, you can't bind the hands of the Royal Bank or whatever lender you have with your separation agreement. So that's, 
that's a legally enforceable contract. So you could say, yeah, if, if, if person A doesn't, if you end up being liable for it, you can say, yeah, I have a good claim then against my ex to pay me back. But that doesn't alter anything that you've signed with the bank in your responsibility. So yeah. you need to make sure that your lawyer is that you're getting those securities or whatever that you're getting out that the other person is refinancing or mortgaging, remortgaging all of those things into their own name. If you don't want that responsibility to follow you out of a separation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So going back to don't borrow with other people. <laughs> <laughs> right or keep an eye on things i guess right if you're yeah yeah and that's tough uh, mm-hmm. because sometimes you're right kim like sometimes you don't know what somebody's spending habits are going to be mm-hmm. until you start getting that queasy feeling yeah so yeah yeah you get married too young with no no education on anything and then um yeah, like you learn things the hard way sometimes. Nobody's forcing you to do the budget. Nobody's telling you to ask your partner about how they're dealing with their own finances. Nobody's giving you any sort of financial help um, and bad behaviors start to form. And unfortunately, they find themselves in either one of your offices because of it, right? And yeah. part of me starts to think, well, I mean, it's the financial planners who are letting everybody down here. The F- FP Canada has really ramped up their spending and marketing, trying to get people aware of, you know, what a financial planner does, which is budgeting and forecasting and making sure that everybody knows where all the money is and that we have enough now and we have enough to retire and we have enough to last us until we die. But that that industry just doesn't have enough CFP professionals to do that kind of work in the bank the bank CFP professionals don't have the time to do those plans. So who's actually getting the plans? It's the high net worth people out there who who get everything. (laughs) (laughs) I think my industry is to blame on all all of these problems now that I'm thinking about it. You're right. You know what? I blame you. (laughs) (laughs) We are to blame. We have let the world down, but hopefully the banks start to uh, force their financial planners to spend the time doing financial planning because we all know that they don't. And, um, yeah, you know, I hope so. Uh, our education system is slowly changing. I hear that budgeting and financial planning and talking about credit is starting to get implemented into the school system, of which I'm thrilled. I've done a few presentations in a few uh, schools myself, and and they're clever kids. They they get it. They understand it. They'll ask great questions. I've always been impressed. They there is nothing that would suggest that they're not going to learn a ton from implementing that right from, you know, grade five. Um, And and maybe one day I'll be obsolete. Um, Hopefully I'm nearing retirement when that happens. (laughs) (laughs) I do have a few more years yet. (laughs) Um, But, uh, but yeah, there's certainly, there's certainly changes that are coming. I am a little bit nervous about what our future holds here. Um, we in the insolvency world do expect that things are going to change. There's a lot of money that's been doled out to individuals and businesses over the last, let's say 18 months or whatever it is with the pandemic. The water taps are gonna shut off and we are thinking that things are going to change MNP did um, a survey. We do one quarterly. Ipsos Read helps us with that. And we collect data over that period of time. And one of the things that I picked up in um, the July is that, so for the national numbers, what they're saying is that 30% of Canadians are reporting being insolvent, which is the highest level since 2017. Uh, not 30? 30%. 30%. Yeah, which is a lot of people. Ooh. 25% of Albertans report being insolvent, which is actually down six points since the, the previous uh, survey we did. However, 43% of them are saying that they have a higher debt burden. 
So only 25% of Albertans think that they're insolvent. Mm. 3% know that their debt is higher than uh, it was previously, and they 35 say it's worse since the pandemic. But then the, the survey also suggested that Albertans were the highest in the country uh, looking to spend more money to revitalize the economy. And so when you have people who have concerns that their debt's really high, but mm -hmm. don't think you're insolvent and tend to spend more, mm -hmm. I would expect that we're going to start seeing a lot more people in our office. Those, those don't work together. Yeah. You can't have more debt and higher concerns and spend more money. It's not going to work. The only way to spend that is on credit. Right. So eventually, they will have to deal with all you get of it. the big D, and now if you go visit Heather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's exactly it. Well, I'm glad we've decided that all of Canadians' financial problems can be blamed on Kim. Um, yep. and, that uh, we can all come to you, Sandra, for some help. Yep. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> um, and if we want to spend tons of time talking about budgeting, I'm your girl. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, I think that, uh, I, I think that folks like Kim are really indispensable and in that learning about money is never, it's never too early. Um, and it's hopefully going to become a less and less taboo and awkward conversation for everyone as, as we go forward, um, you know, in years. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Sandra, it's been wonderful having you on our podcast. Is there anything we missed that we didn't talk about? Yeah. Final words would be budget, budget, budget. <laughs> Don't panic. And please call a trustee. Call me. I'm happy to answer questions. It doesn't cost you anything ask lots and lots of questions uh, before making any big financial decisions. And then if you need, I'll tell you to budget, budget, budget some more. Mm. Yeah, always. Get that expert guidance before you start pulling money out of places and... Absolutely. Yeah. There's, lots of, there's lots of options out there. Um, and as long as you ask a professional who understands um, there's, there's always a million options, even things like a proposal. A proposal isn't just payments. Maybe it is partially pulling out your investments. Maybe it is partially refinancing your house, oh. but it's better to run all those numbers and have all those answers from all of those people before deciding what is the real correct answer. And every single individual is going to have a different solution right doing that in an informed way yes absolutely. Yeah. awesome okay well thank you so much for your time and for coming on the podcast today um i know i've learned a ton about this area um and i hope that it doesn't sound so scary it doesn't seem so scary for me anymore and i hope it doesn't sound so scary for folks that are listening um this has been another episode of access to justice thanks for listening or watching if you have any questions you'd like us to address on the podcast please send an email to access to justice podcast at gmail.com and we'll do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode thanks sandra thanks kim thanks so much for having me it's been a pleasure likewise any information in this video is general information only and is not nor is it intended to be legal advice Watching this video does not create a lawyer-client relationship. You should always seek the advice of a lawyer or other qualified professional for advice regarding your individual situation. 
While we take care to ensure that the information contained in this video is accurate and up-to-date, we make no warranties or representations as to the suitability, completeness, or accuracy of the information contained in this video. Any reliance you place on the information is at your own risk. Kahane Law Office, Merrick Law, Heather Malarick Professional Corporation, Evan Clark Professional Corporation, Evan Clark, Heather Malarick, and any guests will not be responsible nor liable in any way for any content, including but not limited to any errors or omissions in the content, or for any loss or damage of any kind incurred as a result of any content communicated in this video, whether by Evan Clark, Heather Malarick, or by a third party. Kim McDonald is a financial advisor with Raymond James Limited. Information provided is not a solicitation, and although obtained from sources considered reliable, is not guaranteed. The view and opinions contained in this media are those of Kim McDonald, not Raymond James Limited. Securities-related products and services are offered through Raymond James Limited, member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Raymond James advisors are not tax advisors, and we recommend that clients seek independent advice from a professional advisor on tax-related matters. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, RJFE, a subsidiary of Raymond James Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. When providing life insurance products, financial advisors are acting as insurance representatives of RJFP. Darkness of the dales dissipates, declines because of he who turned water. Into